pace car going in this time, and that will leave the 46 car starting grid in the hands of the pole sitter, Nick Pericles. It's his second pole of the year. He's already got one victory to his name, but should probably have more. He won back in Granby from the pole, probably should have won at both Waltham and Watkins Glen, where he led the most laps. He's second in points entering this event behind only DJ Curtis, who is starting 22nd, but he'll somehow find his way to the front when it counts. The 26 of PJ Williams is to the outside of him. He's looking for a breakthrough run in what's been a mediocre season. Behind Pericles, it's Gerald Reddington, one of the one-off drivers in the No Surge Nikos in what will be the final start of his career. More on him later. Gerald Reddington wasting no time on the bottom of the track, making it three wide into turns one and two. The 84 moved up the track to try and block off the 26. And how about Matt McIntyre to, through the middle? from fourth on the starting grid up to second already. Lap two in the books, but Mac McIntyre looks very hungry for that race lead. He dives it hard into turn number one and he's gonna force the 84 to give him room. PJ Williams in the 26 machine right behind trying to figure out who's gonna win in this situation. And behind him, it's Skyla Johnson who's, who he's gonna have to be worried about. Johnson started eighth place and is already looking for a podium spot there, dove it up the inside, wasn't able to make anything of it. The 58 and the 84 still side by side. Pericles defending hard on that lesser preferred outside groove. Didn't really expect a whole lot of speed from the outside until these drivers got some wear into their tires, but uh, Pericles once again seems to have brought one of the cars to beat. It is nice to see Matt McIntyre challenging up at the front, though. He had a strong rookie season last year in the 2016 Hart Can-Am series, but has been struggling this season. We're 13 rounds in, and he's still looking for his first top 10. Looks like he's finally going to snap the lead away from the 84. Got to give a shout-out to another one-off entry. That's Australian Jack Halleck in the number 32H Toyota Camry making his first start in Hark today. He's been livening up the paddock the last few days with some of his pranks, but on the racetrack, he's been all business. He's qualified in the 10th position and hasn't been thrown off by the intensity of the start. He's currently maintaining around the 7th spot, just in front of some more experienced sophomores, Joshua Michaels and Sylvian Lasavage. In fact, he'll get around Michaels there in the 04. He's going to challenge John Bunnell if he can get down to the inside, which seems to be still be the preferred line even uh, with Nick Pericles' antics as we got trouble behind them several cars into the inside wall that's going to be the first caution Freddie Munoz found himself in a difficult spot in turns three and four he was on the outside of a three wide battle got up into the marbles ended up having to check up off of four small Nozomi found herself in an unexpected situation and got into the 0-2 spinning them down the track into Fox Collins and King Munoz with a tough look into the inside wall. He'll drive away. More trouble further up ahead, though. Brian Fox was all out of shape coming out of the contact and ended up driving back into traffic accidentally. He would clip Christian Hartona, one of the points contenders, with significant damage after that one. He hit Alexander Rowe a couple of times as he pinballed off the inside wall. And uh, the 15 of Irving also got a small piece of that. It was a very similar tale for John King in the number 19 as he struggled to turn the discount tire machine. Nicholas Guerra and Denzel Williams would be the unlucky victims, and that would trigger a stack-up that would damage many of the backmarkers, including Brandon Krasta, King Ray, Legacy, and particularly Camphausen, Fitzwater, Guerra, and Knight, who would slide into those DMs real nice. Christian Hartono, in a futile attempt to re-establish the running order, would slow down to a measly 35 miles an hour after taking the caution flag and cause a stack-up incident, one of the largest in recent memory, causing significant damage to John Christchurch in his special scheme, as well as Kaloa Hankins. Other drivers were collected but received more minor levels of damage, and in many cases they were already damaged anyways. In a bizarre incident coming onto pit road, Freddie Munoz would get into the side of race leader Matt McIntyre. It's kind of unclear whether or not Munoz was unsure that the leader would pit or whether he had full control over that heavily damaged mug machine, but in either case, they would get things sorted out by pit road entry. No, no penalties assigned, even though some orange cones were injured in that one. 
All drivers would pit under this caution. However, a new top six would be formed from drivers just getting a quick splash of fuel, led out by Joshua Michaels and ending with Scott Roush there, beating out former race leader Matt McIntyre. Those six are going to be hoping that track position will be more important than the seven or eight green flag laps they put on their tires. Believe it or not, no one else went for a two-tire stop. Everyone else, four fresh tires. We'll have to see how much faster they are on the restart. It's a strong restart from Joshua Michaels as he leads him back to the green flag and gets a big, big jump on Skyla Johnson. Johnson's going to have Henry Williams all over her coming into turn number one. Henrietta Fitzwater is the only retiree at this point. Still 45 cars remain on the racetrack. John King and Freddie Munoz are the only cars one lap down. They both had extended stays on pit road during that caution break. Williams dove it down to Took to try and take second, but Skyla Johnson maintained the spot with the good run off turn two. In fact, Prudence Littlejohn would snap away third on the top side of the track. Joshua Michaels awfully wide through turns one and two. Here comes Skyla Johnson with the run up the inside, but the 31 of Prudence Littlejohn's also there. They make some contact off the corner. Both take a sharp dive towards the inside wall, but keep it going straight, and we're three wide down into three. Somehow, that contact has actually helped the 31, the 29, it looks like. The 01 tried to get in the gas a little bit early off the corner, but ended up having to check up as he got further and further into the marbles, and now he's got hungry drivers all over him. That's... 2015 race winner Sam Curtis joining this gaggle along with early contenders Nick Pericles uh, through in the middle as well as Matt McIntyre and Gerald Reddington all three of them on fresh tires. Skyla Johnson still not quite able to clear as the 31 side drafts down the back straight and throws it into turn number three. Caution is out so we're racing back to the line. Who's going to lead this group of drivers back? It's going to be very close between the 31 and the 29, and it's the 31 by inches. Brian Fox blows a left front on the number 74. Guy cannot catch a break. Lucas Knight gets caught behind Fox as he slows the car to keep it under control. Knight tries to go to the outside to get around the 74, but the 24 is there with a full head of steam, sending them both into the wall and for their second spins of the day. It's been a rough weekend for all three of these drivers. All three were collected in the earlier incident. Knight qualified near the tail end of the field, and Hartono in particular was trying trying to impress here with this race being one of the closest he'll get to his home country of Indonesia. The only three on-pace drivers to pit under this yellow were Joshua Michaels, along with Tommy Turbo and one-off entry Chris Louvier. Each of them only taking right side tires bizarrely and filling it back full of fuel. These guys might be the only ones guaranteed to make it until the end at this point. Prudence Littlejohn leads him back, but Johnson has a better restart this time from second. And already looks to challenge heading into one, falls back into line behind the 31 after all. There's still 43 cars on the lead lap and 45 of the original grid of 46 remain on the track in varying levels of condition of course. Nick Pericles looks low on Curtis down into three. He's going to get third it looks like. He might have a go on the 29 as well. What a move by Pericles in the 84. Seems to be proving that the newer tires were the better option there. However, Johnson and Curtis have the momentum coming out of four. A little bit of a draft train on the outside there. Prudence Littlejohn way too hot getting into turn number one. She's about four lanes up from where she needs to be. Here. And here comes Skyla Johnson. The tides have turned. Now it's Johnson down to the inside of the track. Curtis slipping into line behind the back bumper of the 31. Now dives down to try and help the 29. Seems to think Johnson's going to have the better run coming out of turns three and four Johnson to the lead and now Reddington is back into the mix in the 112. Prudy having a little bit of trouble with turn one it seems again runs very wide and that's going to open up the midline for Nick Pericles to go by and he's through to second it looks like he's going to get by Sam Curtis in the 66 to get himself clear by the time we hit turn number three as well. The racing up front would be interrupted once again though, this time by John Arn checking up just a little off of turn number two. Looks like he was trying to change lanes in the battle for around 20th spot and that caught Ike Durbin 
off guard in the number 86 car. He was trying to slot in behind him, it looks like, but instead got it into the side of the 05 and sent him for a brief trip into the inside wall. Surprisingly, not too much damage to that Zaxby's Camaro. Despite race one having very similar caution characteristics and coming down to fuel mileage in the end, John Arndt was the only car to pit under that yellow. These drivers seem to think that they'll be able to make it to the end on fuel from here, or at least think that they'll be able to get the cautions to be able to do so. Skyla Johnson was twice the bridesmaid for these restarts, but now it's her turn to lead them to the green. Johnson went low with Pericles, but he's gotten to her inside, and I don't think there's a whole lot Johnson can do to defend. Pericles might have this thing coming off a two. No, never mind. Skyla Johnson powers down the back straight, and she's going to hold him off for now. I can't believe I'm saying this, but what an engine Spingai Saitomi Motorsports brought to this track. Here's hoping commentator's curse doesn't strike that team for the umpteenth time this season. But Skyla Johnson going to lead one lap past the restart. Nick Pericles trying once again here on the inside, but Johnson continues to hold him off in the 29 machine. It's not been what Chris Louvier was looking for in Japan, other than the weeb stuff. He's been mired back outside the top 30 since the start of this thing, despite having very little damage on that Fur Affinity Chrysler. It's been an unexpectedly poor showing for Louvier's one-off entry here, especially considering he came oh so close to getting the W here back in 2015, but instead performed one of the sickest Doriftos Hark has ever seen en route to a 7th place finish. The Louisiana native ended his full-time career with a win at the Lee USA Speedway in the final race of the Can-Am USA Tour of 2016, but if he wants to keep going where he left off, he's got a lot of work to do in the second half of this one. Johnson runs slightly offline, and that's just enough of a mistake for Pericles to start setting up a move on corner exit. He nearly gets into the left rear quarter panel of Johnson, and here comes Rennington making it three wide for the lead. For our newer viewers, this move isn't likely to result in, in a crash in turn number three, since Johnson and Pericles are points contenders used to fighting hard for positions week in and week out. And Reddington, despite being a one-off entry for this event, is one of the most experienced Hark racers in the field. Johnson is for forced to relinquish the position. There's not a whole lot of grip that high off of turn four, and it'll be Pericles taking the top spot over Reddington, who struggled with exit speed. Reddington loses more time boxed into the far low line down in turn one, and how about Sam Curtis switching lanes mid-corner? He's going to join the podium with the draft off of turn number two. It's still dead even between Johnson and Pericles. Pericles has Johnson's preferred line this time, and he'll use it to finally get the lead back for the first time since the early laps in this one. I don't think Johnson will be satisfied unless she leads every lap of this thing. She again challenges Pericles, and they've been side by side for a lap and a half already trying to decide this thing. Curtis pushes Pericles past the 29, and Reddington catches Johnson sleeping as he dives to push it three wide into turn number three. If Reddington isn't having fun out there, then he wouldn't be human, which he actually partly isn't. Reddington suffered a devastating accident in the offseason while racing jet skis, losing his right hand and his entire left arm. However, no surge technologies, a specialty fabricator aimed at getting injured athletes back into their sport, approached Reddington with the intention of getting him back into the car, even just for one last race. They've worked with Reddington to help him drive with his prosthetics. Reddington had a chance to test out a prototype for the first time in a, on an actual racetrack back during the Waltham events uh, for round seven, and now he returns for his final race here at Motegi. The No Surge team clearly nailed it, and Reddington is putting on a show after stunning the garage area by qualifying in row number two. Freddy Munoz is the first of the slow lap traffic these leaders have had to deal with today. He took the top side and is making things fairly simple for the leaders. Some new drivers now have a top five within their sights. Joki Lethinen out of Finland has been lurking, and Michael Harvey has charged here from his 30th place starting position. Next up on the leader's plate is John King. Pericles caught him in a really bad spot there heading out of turn number two. Had to check out of the throttle, and that's going to open the door for his rivals who strand him to the outside line all on his lonesome there. New leader is going to be Gerald Reddington in the number 112. 
The front bunch and the rear bunch have received a lot of discussion today, but the midfield has been neglected. John Bunnell is hanging on to a top 15 run with a possible challenge coming soon by Durbin in the 86. Behind them, it's Grayson Acevedo, a driver who hasn't done a whole lot of good since his win at Waltham. Jack Halleck has dropped out of the top 10, unfortunately, and finds himself under attack from Matthew Engelram, who has been on a bit of a charge now that we've finally gotten to a long run, along with Chris Dodd, who we usually don't see this far back in the field. Brandon Krasta, who's finally off of probation from his Olden Park incidents, is right behind these three. Pericles goes after Reddington, this time with help from Michael Harvey. Reddington is awfully wide heading into three, tries to keep his foot in it, but has to back down and even still just narrowly misses the wall there. Joshua Michael's early pit gamble has not worked out in his favor, as he races for 35th place with Jack Legacy and the damaged Lucas Knight. It seems whatever setup Axiom Racing Union has on that car needs some clean air to handle well. It's been a poor showing this weekend for Legacy, who usually either wrecks or is challenging for a win, it seems. Even still, this is his last race without sponsorship. Hopefully that team can put some of the sponsor money towards their Speedway program to get Legacy competitive at the bigger ovals. How about four wide for 15th place? Three rookies in this one, and it's Durbin who backs out first wisely. Grayson Acevedo tries to move up a lane. Nope, Engelram is still there. And the Savage looks like he's going to be trapped on the top lane for turns three and four. Engelram was the last one into that four wide battle and in the third lane off the bottom of the racetrack. And what a power move as he gets at least three positions that lap as he continues his charge to the front of the field. It's moves like that that show why he's considered one of the top rookies of this season. Awesome racing a bit further back as well, as in TV at King Ray leads a tepid group of drivers looking to get something done before this is over. Scott Roush is hanging on to the top side of the racetrack with Louvier stuck in the sandwich of some of the best rookies in the series. Roush has taken his Malaga penalty in stride. If anything, it's only made his will to win stronger, while Caitlin Sang, an excellent road racer, continues to learn the ropes on the speedways in trial by fire format along with her drafting partner, Derek Hamill. There's no doubt Pericles has one of the best cars out there today, but he has stiff competition. Reddington got a good run coming off a two, waited until he was right to the tail of the 84, and stepped to the inside before the 84 could try to defend. The 84 is a little too high up through these corners to have good exit momentum, and the 112 is going to be up by over half a car length at the line this time. Curtis and Nozomi ditch Pericles in favor of potentially apexing the corner with the 112, and despite his best efforts, the 84 will lose the lead again to the 112. I'll tell you what, Pericles better get going with another charge on the 112 or else he'll be under attack from a new rival, Small Nozomi, who found herself at the extreme tail of the field just 35 laps ago after spinning in the first caution. Nozomi's peaked to the inside on the front straight, but just before she could attack, Pericles mounted one of his own on the 112. This time, Pericles is trying a different strategy by trying to keep himself right on the white line at the bottom of the track, but he's lost a lot of time to the 112 this time, despite the wide arc that Reddington took at the top side of the track. The battle for top 10 entry is even hotter than the grid girls in the pre-race ceremonies. J.M. Arcala of the Philippines, a local one-off entry, has fought her way into the top 10, but damn near turns the 58 of McIntyre around. She might not be entirely familiar with how long the hoods on these heart cars are quite yet, especially since she's probably used to the short wheelbase of carts or formula-style cars. Oh my goodness, a huge gaggle is formed from the lap car of Munoz. Several rows of three wide racing as the drivers try to sort things out before we get bigger trouble, and it appears the big losers on that are going to be Sam Curtis, who forces a new lane up the middle trying to desperately close the floodgates. Hey, it worked, but damn, that was dangerous. Reddington is still up front, and I think it's becoming clear that Reddington is going to be a hard man to pass, especially as the tires really begin to wear and we start plugging through the slower lap traffic like this. Nozomi snaps second away from Pericles by using John King as a pick, a veteran move by her, as she now goes after her first win. Her qualifying results may not have shown it, but she's felt strong all weekend. 
It seemed like just a matter of time before an incident between a slower car and a car fighting for a good finish in these final laps would collide, and it ended up being an aggressive move by Bunnell to open up a middle lane to get around Camphausen that was the final nail in the coffin. A good heads-up maneuver by Curtis to avoid making that a bigger incident left this caution just a single car spin, although it's definitely not going to look great on Bunnell's record after being penalized for inattention and rough driving last round at Calder Park. A very close call heading back to the flag though. Jack Lagacy gets in the back of Brian Fox who checked up off of turn number four. Nick Guerra swerves to avoid Lagacy with a little bit of damage to that 18 as he slaps the wall, but uh, overall everybody keeps it in a straight line as we hit our fourth caution of the race. With less than 10 laps remaining, it wasn't too much of a surprise to see no one roll a dice in pit for tires. There's simply not enough time to make up the track position. Since the first yellow came out later on in this race, then in race number one, everyone should be able to go on fuel this time. Reddington leads the field back, just eight laps remaining, and Nozomi continues to be right on his tail. This caution was very timely for the rest of the field, who are getting a bit strung out due to the lap traffic. Harvey sits, Harvey sits third, with Arcala having somehow made her way up to fourth when it counts. This is small Nozomi's best shot so far in her career at a victory, and in her home race no less. Nozomi is a former celebrity in Japan, and a small contingent of fans have showed up to support her in her new stock car racing venture, and she's sure given them what they paid for. She's got a lot on her plate right now, though. Harvey is all over her like weebs on anime, and Arcala is waiting in the wings to, to have her own go at this thing in the Chegg 171. Arcala around the outside of the 72 to third, and with Nozomi struggling to mount a charge on the inside of Reddington, we could have a fight on our hands between the sh two shortest drivers on the grid, both standing a firm four foot nine. Reddington continues to hold on, and if there's any driver in the field that knows how to handle the intense pressure of holding off multiple drivers in the final laps, it's him. He's got five Hark wins under his belt, putting him second on the all-time win list behind only Alex Tanker. And for four of them, he's led at the white flag. I'll be damned if he makes a mistake on his own. These two behind him are going to have to force one, but right now it looks like they're focusing too much on one another. It's been back and forth between Arcala and Nozomi the last few laps, and with just two laps to go, it's go time or no time. Nozomi with a run to the bottom of the track at the white flag. Can Nozomi make her home country proud? Reddington shuts the door into turn number one, and Arcala confines Nozomi to the low side. Gerald Reddington never expected to be back in a race car after his massive jet ski accident. But now, in Motegi, he's just two turns away from doing the impossible. Nozomi and Arcala continue to battle for second. It doesn't look like they're going to get there. And Gerald Reddington, after a year off, driving with prosthetics with the help of the No Surge crew, is going to take his sixth Hark victory at Motegi in his final career race, tying him with Alex Tanker as the all-time winningest driver in series history. It is surely an emotional victory for everyone involved. From his friend and former car owner Tyler Thaber on the sidelines to his friends and family watching at home as well as the No Surge Nikos crew that spent thousands of hours working with Reddington to help him get back in the car and of course for Reddington himself. What a story for the other members of the podium as well. Nozomi gets the best finish of her career in second place. Still not the W she was looking for but when you're battling the best of the best you can't always achieve that. What a performance in front of her home crowd, and since she was the best of the Hark regulars, it's a massive points day as well. In her first start, the local entry out of the Philippines, J.M. Arcala, did an awesome job in a stock car, keeping herself out of the early trouble that damaged so many and charging to the front in the late stages. She'll be one to watch if she ever gets a chance at a full campaign. Michael Harvey finished a close fourth in the 72 machine. For a bit there, it looked like Hurricane Harvey might have a second win duh, here at Motegi, but alas, it was not to be. He posted the fastest lap of the race and tied for the hard charger with 12th place finishing Matthew Engelram. Both of those drivers climbed 26 positions from their starting place. Matt McIntyre finishes P5, which has got to feel like a win for them, the way the season has gone for them so far. McIntyre led seven laps and had to battle hard all day for that one. 
Skyla Johnson came across the line sixth after leading some laps early on. She couldn't quite seem to keep up with some of the later challengers in this one, but this race will still greatly contribute to her points run. Robert Piet snuck in at the end for a seventh place finish, closely followed by points leader DJ Curtis in eighth. Both kept their noses clean in this one and quietly posted top tens in a technique that has been coined as Pietting, with reference to Piet's extremely quiet yet efficient title run back in 2016. The Finn, Jokey Lethanen, came home ninth in the 666 after having several bouts in the top five over the course of the day. He just didn't quite have the speed to make an independent charge further forward. Prudence Littlejohn le led several laps early on, but similar to Johnson, she just didn't quite have the brute performance of the later, later challengers and fell to the bottom of the top ten by race's end. One driver you may have noticed not mentioned in the top 10 was Nick Pericles. The pole sitter had one of the dominant cars of the day and led many laps, but on the second to last lap fell victim to a problem under the hood, forcing him to retire just a mile and a half from the top five finish, very reminiscent to his engine failure from the lead at Watkins Glen. DJ Curtis, with yet another top 10 finish, holds on to the points lead. The standings themselves are beginning to get a bit strung out, due to Curtis's brute consistency. Nine top tens and 13 starts is insane for this series, and it only becomes more impressive when you consider that he's 9 for 11 in the races that he's actually finished. Demir Bejenov, however, did actually manage to close the gap to Curtis with his third place finish. His five top fives make his record nearly equally as impressive. Matthew Engelram continues his reign as top rookie, jumping a spot to third in the standings with his hard charge to claim 12th at Motegi. Skyla Johnson is up three spots and nearly went over Engelram as well with her impressive sixth place effort. She's got a very good shot to put Fingai Saitomi Motorsports in the championship hunt for the first time in several years. Michael aka Hurricane Harvey swirls up four positions in the leaderboard to the top five. He sits more than a round's worth of points back of Curtis, but with nine rounds to go, there's lots of time for things to change. Nick Pericles was the big loser this time around. Had he completed the last lap, he could have found himself right up there with Bejenov, but instead he drops to sixth in the standings. That team really needs to figure out their engine program if they plan on mounting a legitimate championship bid. Caitlin Sang posted a very mediocre run and falls further back from the championship lead, but not as much as Christian Hartono, who falls three spots to eighth after receiving serious damage in the big wreck in race number two. For the first time this year, Hartono was both out-qualified and out-finished by his infamous CCR teammate, Tony Tabularis, who continues to have a firm grasp on the 84th and final place in the standings, with a mere 202 points to his name. With the international tour complete, we head to Alberta to begin the North American tour with the inaugural Hark event at the Calgary Speed Park, a lengthy but fast road course that will mark the last of its kind before we head into a stretch of six straight ovals. <laughs>